Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, my name is Michael Huby. I uh, had the lead on the restoration of the Gregory. We acquired the car in, I think, 2012. And uh, I've been working on and off on it since that time. So it's been now 11 years. But I built some other things in between, like the Gyro X and the BMW 700 over there. And so it, it took some time. But uh, first, I want to set the scene a little to give you an idea about what led us to this car coming over these in the background, because these are all Gregory designs and constructions. And uh, so I want to set the scene a little who Ben Gregory was. Uh, born in 19, 1889, he started flying uh, airplanes in 08 and racing cars in 08. So really at the beginning of aviation and car racing and all these things were just invented. And uh, so he built his first, or he helped assemble the first plane in 08, and then went from there, built multiple airplanes, started learning to fly, and then started learning building cars. And then World War II came, so there was a brief interruption in him uh, pursuing his own dream of flying and, and racing. But in that time, while he was working in a motor pool, he met Walter Christie. And Walter Christie was a, a forward, a front wheel drive pioneer. He built the first couple of really uh, monumental uh, race machines with aircraft engines and front wheel drive. But the right joints didn't exist, so steering was a bit of an issue and they just wanted to go straight and steering was really hard and hard to control, so that, that didn't go anywhere. But it kept in the back of uh, Ben Gregory's mind, so in, after World War II, uh, sorry, after World War I, he started constructing his own car. And uh, one of them, we see him here at the wheel of his 1921 racer, it was, uh, propelled by a Curtis Wright aircraft engine, so a really big engine, and that's, this car already had front wheel drive. Still with universal joints, uh, so steering was not that good, but he kept developing and developing, and so in the years between 1918 and 1922, he built about 10 cars with uh, front wheel drive. And then in the 20s, there was a major invention made, the Rezepa constant velocity joint, which then for the first time managed bigger steering angles on a car with a front wheel drive. So he immediately incorporated that in his designs, but they never went in any sort of serious production. They were just one-offs and he sold a couple of them, but it never went anywhere. And at that time he uh, made his money as a chauffeur with one of his cars for a madam of a uh, house of ill repute. <laughs> and, uh, allegedly, uh, that madam had two big diamonds that she always had in her hand, like dice. And one of these days, allegedly, Brand Ben Gregory stole these diamonds, hid them in the tank of the car until everything blew over and then took the diamonds out and disappeared to California for a while, where he then turned the diamonds into an aircraft engine and uh, put that in another one of his cars. And then after that, he returned back to Kansas and started flying. He started barnstorming. He became a really avid flyer, and uh, he bought a, a biplane, and then flying with Ben became some sort of a slogan in the area, so he went to, from county fair to county fair and uh, took people on flights with him for a dollar fifty or something like this. And then the recession hit, and it, he still continued doing it and uh, reduced the, uh, the price to 50 cents. And so he flew about 4,000 people in a single weekend. When you break that down into, he flew into the night, daytime, nighttime, from morning till evening, just to make money. 
And when you break that down, that's about 190 starts and, and landings a day. And, uh, and it's no surprise that he had seven crashes that he walked away from in the period until 1942 when he stopped flying after the last one. The last one broke his legs pretty badly, and that was it. But in between, he invented the in-flight marriage. You could go on his plane, uh, and he had a priest in the back, and then you could get married. And so about 90 couples uh, took advantage of that. <laughs> he built a plane with uh, lights and smoke generators in the back and flew that at night. And you have to imagine all of this without any radar or any navigation instruments or something. This was all just line of sight flight. And uh, the, the plane would fly across the sky with you know, sparks flying and lights flashing and the people thought it was a UFO and stuff like that. So all this to say, he was a pretty inventive guy and uh, he always kept pushing the envelope doing things different than anybody else had done it before. And so after World War II, in World War II, after his crash, he wasn't allowed to fly anymore. So he became an engine inspector in the war effort for plane engines and worked until World War II ended. And in 45, I can hit one. I totally forgot we have a, plane, a picture of him in one of his plane. And you can already see if the picture is unfortunately not complete, but here it said Gregory Front Wheel Drive Car Company. So he already had advertising for his cars on his planes, and this is from a, about 1932, this picture. And uh, so in, after World War II, he started seriously uh, thinking about building cars. And in 45, he um, filed a patent for a front suspension that would allow a vertical, uh, in, in vertical center steering that would not influence by the drive line. So you could turn and there would be no influence from the drive line. Can you hit the next one? This is the patent drawing. And uh, when you see the hub carrier from this car, this is one of the original hub carriers of the car. You can see that the wheel sits in line with the steering axis. This is the steering axis that the car would normally turn on. And the wheel bearings are very big so that the constant velocity joint can sit in the middle of it with its axis also perfectly aligned in this hub carrier. And so, that made it possible to have zero influence on the steering when you do a sharp turn and, and under power. And so he filed this in 1945. It finally got then uh, applied in 1950. But in 1946, he already built this one. That's the sedan. It's a rear engine, front wheel drive car. So it's got everything different than you would normally have it. And uh, when you look underneath, the uh, hub carrier is already exactly the same. The swing arms, they are uh, leading in the front swing arms and trailing swing arms in the, front, in the rear. So you have independent suspension. The uh, leaf springs are longitudinal under the sills, basically. So everything was very unusual, but very neatly engineered. And, um, but he couldn't find anyone that was interested in the concept because it was simply too quirky. It had everything different than anybody else at that time. But he kept at it. And uh, so by early 1950, he started developing a vehicle for the military which is the Mighty Might. Same concept again. It was a Porsche engine. It had a tube frame. It had the same front suspension and rear suspension in a similar way. Obviously, it didn't need steering, but uh, it 
had all the makings that already were present in this one, only then with an aluminum body on it, so it weighed about 1,500 pounds. The idea was that the Marines could, uh, could throw this out of a helicopter in whatever scenario they needed it. And the helicopters at that time had a weight limit, and so they need to stay under that. So it was very lightweight, the Porsche engine being air-cooled and magnesium uh, housing, uh, the crankcase and everything was very lightweight. And um, during the research for today, I came across the dates. We always thought this was like 1960 because that's what it's labeled at. It's an AMC Mighty Might 1960. But he started developing this in 1950 and 51. And this car was started in 51. So you find a lot of what he was developing in this, in this car. And um, it has an aluminum body. It has a Porsche engine. It's got the same front hubs. These are the original ones. A tube chassis, leading arm, swing arms in the front, trailing in the back. So it's got the same recipe, just in a much nicer form and in a much nicer shape. And um, the Mighty Might was picked up by uh, AMC, Hudson, Studebaker, and what was the third one? It was three companies. Packard, thank you. And uh, so when I restored this car, I was like, why did he use Studebaker brakes? Of all cars in the world, why you know the car is a hodgepodge of all kinds of uh, parts, and uh, but why Studebaker brakes? Uh, they were not that common, but now in the research we found out that uh, they were developing this with Studebaker, so they had the parts pool from them, and so the brakes on this one and this one are identical. <laughs> so which then uh, hit the next one. Here you can see the front suspension of the Gregory Sport Roadster as it is now. You can see the um, drive shaft come in. There's a, a ball that contains the Rezeppa gear that is sealed with an O-ring within the hub carrier so no dirt and water can come in. And uh, the wheel is a MGTD. And he used these wheels. When you look, the wheels are all very, the offset is very inward. And that is so that the center line of the tire is exactly in the center line of the steering. So that you need these bulbous uh, wheel centers for that. And um, can you go to the next? In the process of restoring it, we found out that the car at some point had a really bad accident. It uh, must have crashed right front side, and it shifted the whole frame in a diamond shape. It bent the front right suspension, and uh, it had damage to the cowl. So, and the windshield frame was broken off. So it might have actually landed on its not existent roof. And <laughs> so there was quite some damage there. And one of the things that they couldn't reproduce was the, uh, the front hub carrier. So what they did was they used the original existing one and recast it. And you, later, when we're done here, you can come and look at it. And this was on the car. This is a very bad casting. It's very porous. And it's a little smaller than the original because when you cast something, it shrinks about 3%. So this was really unsafe. What do you do? Because we don't want a wheel to fall off, we had new ones machined in 6061 uh, aluminum, but they are CNC machined this time. And so we do a lot of in-house CAD design. We design these pieces uh, on the computer and then farm them out to a company that does the machining for us. We don't have a CNC center here ourselves. And uh, so we incorporate 
modern technologies into uh, making these parts. And so we were able to make complete new hub carriers and can retire the old questionable ones. The next thing from the accident was uh, the chassis. The chassis was, like I said, bent. It was shifted sideways. It was twisted along its longitudinal axis. And on top of that, it had a bunch of corrosion. And what you see here is one of the uh, suspension pickup points in the front. And someone had stick welded. I don't want to really call it welding, but someone had hot glued uh, a piece of steel onto it in order to stabilize the uh, suspension pickup from breaking off. And of course, there was nothing to do about that uh, in just partially fixing it. So what we did was we cut all the pieces out, cleared them of the corrosion. So we, these are the pickup points, they're machine parts. And on the left-hand side, you can see the cut off remains of the uh, tube frame. Cut them all out. Next one. And then uh, we jigged up the frame. This is the, uh, the frame is basically four pieces of tubing, four inch uh, diameter in a square. And then the front and the rear subframes are welded onto that that carry the engine and the rear of the, end of the car. So we jigged that up and then uh, started welding a new one from scratch. You can see the one in the foreground, that's the old one. And I try to use as many parts of the old one as we can. We try to preserve as much of the original uh, as we can because otherwise it's not a restoration anymore, it's, it's a replica. And uh, <clears throat> so every single piece that I could use of the, of the frame went into it. And uh, same with the body. The body, that's the right front fender. It had a ginormous crack that basically on the other side, of course, went all the way up. And someone had just riveted a piece of steel sheet metal on the back. And uh, that, of course, contact corrosion got to it over time. But again, it would be easier to make a whole new fender from scratch because the old one was so badly damaged. But we want to preserve as much as possible, so we cut it out and uh, then fabricated a in new insert and uh, hit the next, and then welded in. And this went on basically on the whole body. The, the body was front to back very damaged, and uh, it's an aluminum body that had been formed on a power hammer. And to get it smooth afterwards, they used the body file to file the, the whole thing smooth. So you end up with a body that has very different thicknesses all over. So when you try to hammer dolly it to straighten it out, it just moves all over the place and you can never get it straight. And uh, so a lot of time went into that, just pure hand hammer dollying. And uh, you can see the, the rear uh, tail lights. Everything was welded five times, cracked again, welded up again, cracked again, and then someone just put tons of Bondo on top and <laughs> put a paint job on it and called it a day, you know. By the way, then the taillights, everything on this car came from something. But I'm not of the 50s generation. I'm not American, as you might have heard. Uh, <laughs> So you look at the parts and you're like, what is it? You know, and so the taillights turned out to be 53 Plymouth, which then collided a little bit with uh, the information we had that the car is a 52. Unless they had a time machine, it's getting kind of difficult to make a car in 52 with 53 taillights. And same with the front windshield it was a 53 Plymouth as well. And um, the door handles interior are all Ford, Ford Crestline or Ford truck. The steering wheel is a Ford Crestline. This is the original steering wheel. We just had it refurbished. And a company in California does amazing work. And these are Ford as well, 54, I think. So all these parts, are around the 53, 54 mark. 
the car is first mentioned in a magazine in 56. So it's always a, it's, when you don't have a real idea documented when things have been done, it's sometimes very difficult to see when a car was really finished. I mean, it's like here, we took 10 years. So, and um, this is another thing that in restorations always comes. You have to really take every single part. And uh, this is a, um, one of the steering arms that holds the tie rod end onto the wheel. And it, it's a welded part that someone in 1952 with a stick welder and a hammer uh, made. And after cleaning it, the part is about this big. And that's a hairline crack in the steering arm. You know, and if you don't inspect every single piece before you put it on or refurbish it, this is easily overlooked. And then you find out later down the road literally. So, and uh, this is one of two interior shots that we had that shows the seats and the inner door cards. These were the only picture, pictures we had. And so it's a black and white picture. So sometimes it's really tough to find out you know, what color was it, what material was it. And the interior of the car at some point had been painted gray with just paint. And when we disassembled it, under the dashboard, we found a little piece of vinyl that had the original color. And uh, so we cleaned this up. This here is the clean part. And so we were able to determine what interior color it had and what material they use. It's like a Naga hide, early vinyl type. And uh, so we were able to get the right shades of the interior, but the seats were missing when we got the car. It had installed some Volkswagen seats, I think, but they were obviously not the right ones. So we started making this the second shot. You can see just the seat uh, base. And this is, by the way, Mr. Ben Gregory in his later years. He lived to be 85 years old and drove the car up until his death. There's no exact numbers, but estimated is he drove it about 300,000 miles in his life. He was like constantly just zooming around with it. And um, he's sitting on the door. By the way, I wouldn't do that because it's, <laughs> it's, it's very lightweight. Okay, so then again, uh, cat design came to the rescue, and so we designed a seat base and a seat frame, then cut the pieces and welded up a new frame uh, in the shape that we thought would come close to the original. And this was all good and nice until this morning uh, when we drove in the Mighty Might. And my coworker was like, look at the seat back of the Mighty Might. And so I went and took the interior picture that we have and went to the Mighty Might. And guess what? Which is another example of that these two cars were made side by side, basically, in the same shop at the same time, because they used the prototype Mighty Might seat back just made a different seat base. It has a box around it. These are only little bolsters that sit on the floor of the Jeep, so they had to make something more nice. But in effect, that's the one. So if one of you knows uh, of a pair of Mighty Might seats, uh, I have an open ear for that. Because <laughs> we're going to change them out now that we know that they are. Uh... So yeah, and after that, um, it, little details like the gauges, Stuart Warner gauges, pretty common here in America in the 50s. Um, but the little lights were random. I thought they might be aircraft or something, little uh, idiot lights from something, because they, they looked very generic. But then it turned out they are Porsche. 
the pre A356 Porsche lights. So they're not easy to come by. So I had to refurbish the original ones again. And uh, you can tell which one I think is the after picture. And, uh, but that's where the time goes in a restoration like this. You know, it's the hours and hours that you go and take these little things apart without breaking them and clean these little knurled uh, outside rings around them and polish up the little LED, uh, the little lenses inside. And then uh, we had the gauges rebuilt and uh, the plate that they sat on that you saw before, that is the original plate. It was a stainless steel plate, so all we had to do is just clean it of all the gunk of years and then polish it up and it came back like this. And um, then when it sits in the whole dashboard, you can start to get a picture. And uh, same thing with all the knobs, all the switches, everything. You take it apart, you clean it, you, know, you put it back together. Because you can buy reproductions of some of these, but they never look the same. They never feel the same. So you just go and take the original. The shifter, by the way, that you see there is a... Uh, Porsche 356. They probably took the whole drivetrain out of the pre-A and used that. And uh, yeah, the steering wheel, the insert in the center is a G that is under, under resin, basically. Can't see it. You only can see it in the sun. Uh, it's a, <laughs> it looks black, and then when the sun comes on it, it's a G. We might remake that and make it a little bit more visible that you can see the G at the bottom. And uh, I think that's the last picture, right? So yeah, the rest is uh, paint. And uh, we try to keep it period correct. So this is a single stage paint job. The original paint color mixed. It looks orange inside. When it's outside, it's more salmon. It's like it has a white tinge to it. So, uh, yeah, and that's the Gregory for you. So, thank you. Yeah, and, and if, if, you, if you have questions now, then I'm trying to answer them. Thank you, George. Just curious, after going through all the detail, how many man hours do you have into this car? <laughs> That's a hard question because, like I said, we, we worked on it since 2012. And it started out as a, oh, it's just not running right, it's not stopping right, you know. <laughs> the, you all have been there, I guess, you know. <laughs> and uh, before you know it, you've, you're in a complete restoration. But... It's, it's really hard to tell. I mean, constant work on it is probably the better part of three years. So whatever that is in man hours. I was going to say, if you could, uh, the gauge cluster, polishing that, yeah. can you ballpark just, just that for, for frame of reference, how long it took you to get well, things? To, to do the whole thing, to make it look like it is all, and, and to get it function right, it's four or five days to get it all right. Because you end up, there's a knurling on the, on, the, um, on the ignition switch, and it was worn down. So when you, when you then put it all together in a brand new restoration, and you have that worn down knurling, it doesn't look right. So you put that thing on the lathe, you make a, you know, a, a, a collet for it to hold it in the lathe securely and you redo the knurling on it, you know. And then you sand it lightly so it's not so sharp and new, so it blends in again, and then you put it back on, you know. And then when you need a washer to go under that, and the washer that was on it is slightly distorted, and it doesn't look right, you machine, a, you know, a really half a millimeter thin washer that goes under there, you know? and that's where the hours go. 
Something to keep you off the streets and out of trouble. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's for sure. Um, the headlights look like Ford, but yes. the, the turn signals, are those 356 Porsche? No, those are Ford as well. They are? Yeah. Hmm. They are um, Ford Crestline, I want to say. Wow. They are Ford. Yeah, yeah, that, that's the thing. And sometimes you... You look at it and you're like, oh, I know that. A friend of mine walked in while I was working on the car and he's like, oh, those are 50 some Ford uh, bumpers. I'm like, oh, good to know, you know. So, yeah. The process of deciding like, where you're going to start and what's going to, like, now we're going to take it off and we're going to start, like, do the frame. Like, do you, do you, is that like a like is it like a planning thing or is it more like we're gonna do this one thing and then oh there's this other thing and then there's this other thing or like well is it like the, a project plan in thing? this case it started with uh, the engine wasn't running right and when you push the clutch in the 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 uh, the belt pulley came out about an eighth of an inch so there was internally something really wrong in the engine so we took the engine out and started rebuilding the engine. And while we were doing that, we were like, oh, look at this, and look at this, and look at this. So it's, if, you, if you go into it with the no, knowledge that you do a full restoration, you then have a little bit more method. But sometimes it just develops into that, because you think the car is better than it actually is, which happens a lot, unfortunately. And uh, then you just go, and then you start with the basics. You start with the foundation, you start with the frame, you know, the suspension, you start sourcing parts because sometimes then you wait for a part or you wait for something to be machined and in the meantime you do something else. But normally you, you start with the basics with the chassis and go from there and then body, then interior. The last interior pieces went in today, so... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. We got it. We Jeff bought the car, and it came in, and it was running and driving, just not very good. <laughs> and so he said, "Oh yeah, we just do the brakes. Uh, to do the brakes, you need to take the transmission out because the the frame rails basically the, it's got inboard brakes on the front, normal brakes in the wheels on the back, but the inboard brakes are so close to the frame rails that you can't take the drums off." without taking the transmission out. So, and then you have the transmission out, and it's like, oh, there's a crack in the frame, and you know, and just 10 years later. So, yeah. Is this the first Gregory the museum got, or is that the first? Yeah, we got the sedan first. Did we get the sedan first? Yeah. yeah. And then this, and then the Mighty Might? That was part of the original 75 cars donation in the very beginning. Then we got, uh, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure the sedan came off eBay um, hmm. from my memory. And then uh, I knew of the Roadster, but um, it wasn't available. And then Myron Vernus bought it um, when the gentleman that owned it passed away. Yeah. And then Myron sold it to us. Oh, yes. Well, no, that was uh, another uh, thing in the period in between Mr. Gregory and the, we buying it from Myron, the car was raced. So it had, there's a picture of it on a racetrack with like a big roll bar on it. And, and you know, so um, if the accident happened there or earlier in its life, it's not documented. Um, there's no record of the car having a crash at all. So it was not known until we started digging into the car. But it was raced for a period in the 70s or 80s. Uh, of course, yes. Uh, let me open it up. So the engine is a uh, is unfortunately not the original one. Um, it's a 356. It's the same engine it had, but the original one was lost and the engine that came with the car was so worn that we couldn't uh, spindle out the crankcase anymore. So this is a replacement engine. 
and it's got a 1950 Volkswagen gearbox, which is consistent with what Porsche 356 at that time had. And uh, lever action shocks. Here you can see the inboard brakes. Oh, Lord. That was the thing that Gregory had on all cars. All these cars here have inboard brakes, so that keeps the unsprung masses uh, low, and also doesn't put too much heat into, the, into those big wheel bearings. He didn't have any space for any, uh, any brakes in these big wheel bearings. Is the shift pattern backwards? Yeah. The shift pattern is upside down, because it's a rear engine turned 180 degrees and pointed to the front. No, just, just the jig, yeah. Yeah, we, we, we set up the jig, and then we had to compensate for the distortion of the frame, because you couldn't, you know, you replicate a, a bent frame, you know. But that's the only thing we had. No, there's no, there's no documentation, unfortunately. And this is one of one, right? This is one of one, yeah. Steering is good. It's a little heavy when you, when you stand still because it's only two turns side to side. So it's a very direct steering. But once you get going, it's, it's really good. The whole car, the, the most amazing thing is how modern the car feels. It's got an extremely good ride. It got, it's got good uh, handling. The traction is really good, you know. So when you compare to anything early 50s, it's really much better than anything that would be on the road at that time. And it was quick because it's very lightweight. It weighs, I think, like 1,800 pounds, maybe, you know? And uh, the engine has about 70 horsepower, so it, it moves. It's like you can, you can lift the, the car in the back. You can lift it up. It's, yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah, you can look underneath. I don't yeah. Bend over real well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's a, there's a pull down here, and then it opens up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a Ford, uh, Ford gas tank. Yeah. It, 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 it's light in the back, but you don't really feel it when you drive and when you sit in it, uh, especially with two people. The